morning, by the grace of God, I'm going to be sharing with us um, a message titled The Spiritual Roles of Fathers. Today is not Father's Day. Today is Founder's Day. A day that we celebrate a father. Hallelujah. So I want to share with you the spiritual roles of fathers because beyond procreation, beyond provision, there are certain deep roles that a man has over his children and over his wife. And it's a position of honor. Amen. Such that if you do not have that understanding, you will not only fail your children, you will fail your wife, you will fail the church, you will also fail God. Hallelujah. So we must have a deep understanding. Papa quoted the scripture sometimes ago and it stuck to me. He said, a man that is in a position of honor, that does not know it, is worse than a beast. So as men, we need to understand our position, especially our spiritual roles in the home. We must not abdicate our spiritual roles to pastors. Amen. We must take responsibility for it because we are the ones who can deliver on that mantle. Nobody can do it for us. Hallelujah. And of course, while I will be focusing this message again on fathers, every one of us as children and wives also have support responsibility. We need to make that job easy for them because being a father and being a husband is a difficult job. How many of you agree with me? It is difficult to be a father and a husband. Hallelujah. And we need to provide support for them. Being a father is one of the most honorable and important role any man will have in his lifetime. He can become MDCU. He can become the president of his nation. He can become Secretary General. I see that in the life of Barack Obama. He has a deep relationship with his children. Because he understands that after the 80 years of being a president, he still needs to come back home to be a father. For pastors too, after they come to the pulpit, they wear suit, wear long tie, and then they deliver power, they still have a responsibility at home that is bigger than pastoring the church. Amen. And for you who are not in ministry, when you go out and you make all the money and make all the millionaire, everything, you still have a responsibility at home. And it's a big responsibility. Praise the Lord. And because the job of a father is tough, everyone, every man, every Christian man must have a father over him. I'm not talking about biological father. You must have a spiritual father. You know why? Because it takes a spiritual father to raise a spiritual father. Your biological father, if he does not have the level of spirituality to deliver on that role, cannot deliver it to you. And the same thing with everybody. Amen. You must have a father over your life. It's key. It's important. Because you can't survive life without, being, without having a father. Hallelujah. And that again goes to, I mean, again, I would direct my, 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 my talk right now to single ladies. Please don't marry a brother that does not have a spiritual father over his life. Marriage is tough. Love fits like this. You will learn that next week. Amen. We're going to be hosting our papa and mama in the Valentine's session. So we're going to direct all up. All up. I thought somebody would be happy. So we will be the host next week. Papa and mama will be our guests. So we can ask them all questions. What am I talking about? Hallelujah. So single sisters, make sure the person you want to marry has a father over him. Somebody that can tell him, sit down. Somebody you can report him to. Amen. If he does not have, it's a red flag. He becomes a lord of his own. Nobody to guide him. Hallelujah. God understood the power in authority and made sure that he used his word to guard himself. 
Hallelujah. So that he, even God, will not misbehave. Praise the Lord. If God did that, you need to ensure that the person that is psyching you and is receiving you has a father over his head. A father that he respects. A father he can, you can report him to when he messes up. Because if he doesn't, it can be tough. Amen. And I quickly want to say this in passing. Single sisters, make sure you marry a man that you can submit to. Because the moment you get married to a man, the spiritual responsibility on your father shifts to him. The things that your father does for you in the place of the spirit automatically, once he collects dowry, he transfers that responsibility to the man. And if you are disrespectful to the man, if you dishonor the man you marry, then you cannot reap the benefits that comes with marriage. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am not saying you should be submissive to every man. The Bible said, wives, Submit to your own husband. Your own husband. You can be boss in the place of the secular world. But when it comes to your home, you must give that reverence. Because your father, your husband is also your father. Hallelujah. Very, very critical. Praise the Lord. I want to also say this, and I'm sure... Um, if not in this church, people online would almost um, kill me on it. The message of equality of man and woman in the marriage is unscriptural. The message of man and woman equal in marriage is satanic. Don't buy to it. Praise the Lord. The man who is the husband is the head of your home. A man who is the head in another person's home, who is your MD, you can disrespect him. You can dishonor him. Amen. In fact, you can try and rebel against him, which has its own consequences anyway. But when it comes to your home, no matter the level of anointing you carry, that man has a spiritual role in that home. Which is why it is very important. Somebody is asking me, Pastor, but if my husband is not born again, what should I do? You've got to pray for him. Pray for him until he accepts Christ. Until he begins to exercise those authority, that role in the home. He doesn't take God seriously. Pray for him. Let me share something with you. Men are usually very late to adopt and accept spiritual things. But once they accept it, they run and overtake any other person. If a man and a woman comes to church the first time, while the, the, the choir, all of them are praising God and the whole place is charged, a man may just put his hand in his pocket and say, what are they doing? Whereas the woman is already on the floor rolling on the ground. The man would not make any meaning of it until he has an encounter but once he has that encounter, you can't hold him down. You that you have, you think you have anointing, you've not seen it. So, that man that you think does not come to church now, the day he starts coming to church, he may be the next resident pastor. Are you listening to me? So, that is why it is important for you, women, to ensure you not only live as Christians at home, don't challenge the authorities of your husband. The more you challenge the authority of your husband as a Christian, the more you push him far away from God because he does not want to associate with a God that teaches his wife to disobey and disregard him. Are you following me? Let's look at those roles. And now I'm going to be talking to men. Amen. I'm going to be talking to us. Because for all these four things, I can see in the life of our papa. Amen. I can appreciate these four things 
in his life. In fact, by extension, even in the church. But as men, we need to begin to do Messiah. We need to be the papa of our home and begin to do all of these things in our home. Number one rule is that men are custodians of covenants in their home. Are you following me? Men establish covenants. They destroy covenants. And they sustain covenants in their homes. That's their job. You will not hear the God of Sarah. You will not hear the God of Rebekah. You will hear the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? These are the people God had a covenant with. So I ask you, men, what covenant do you have with God? Hallelujah. And for brothers, single brothers who are not married, don't wait till you get married before you have that covenant. The covenant God had with Jacob, he had it when he was single. Are you following me? So, make sure that that covenant, you start initiating it right now. Are we together? And the thing about covenant is that don't wait for God to initiate it. You can initiate the covenant. In fact, you should start from the covenant that exists in your foundation. And let me quickly tell you this. If men don't take responsibility for the kind of covenant that runs in their homes, is the covenant that their great grandfather and their grandfathers and their fathers made with demons and Satan that will run in their home. By, it's by default. So you need to search out the existing covenant and then break them in the place of prayers. Hallelujah. I'm still learning about covenant from mama. I'm, I'm, I mean, she told me some things that were they will start. You've got to replace any existing covenant. You need to enter into a more powerful covenant in Christ. For instance, the covenant of prosperity. Amen. If the covenant of poverty is existing in your home, hallelujah, you need to enter into a covenant of prosperity with God to replace and to destroy that existing covenant. If there is a covenant of untimely death in your home, you need to enter into a bigger covenant in Christ. Hallelujah. And that will automatically destroy this existing covenant. So, we must be intentional. In Proverbs 13.22, the Bible says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Hallelujah. Sometimes when we read that scriptures, we think about properties. It's probably it. Amen. It's probably property. It's probably lands. Amen. It's probably cars. Maybe shares. But the biggest inheritance a man can pass down to his children and his children's children is an inheritance of covenant. Abraham did not pass down to Isaac riches. And, no, no, no. It's the existing covenant that was with God that he passed down. He received that covenant and had it, handed it over to Jacob. Praise the Lord. So, do not give your children, don't share, don't share mistakes with your children. Share promises. What has God told you in the place of prayer when you are tarrying with him? When you come for vigil and there is a declaration from this altar by Papa or by men of God and you cut it and you say, this is for me. Those are the kind of covenant you need to transfer to your children. And you say, in this home, people don't die young. In this home, people don't come last. It's a covenant with God. In this home, the devil cannot attack you. It is not possible. I have a covenant of protection with God. Pass it down to them. Praise the Lord. So they don't struggle. So it is your responsibility to destroy old covenants in the place of prayers establish new ones and hand it down to your children. And covenants can sleep. That is why after you enter into that covenant with God, you've got to continually serve each seat on the altar of prayer and on the altar of seeds. Are we together? 
Number two. Number one role is that men are custodians of covenants. Number two is that men are validators. Validators. I want everyone, when you get home, read Numbers chapter 30, verse 1 to 16, the entire chapter. For single sisters, make sure you read that place. Men, read it. Study, then you. Numbers 30, 1 to 16. Numbers 30, the entire, the entire chapter. Hallelujah. You are the one, as a man, who validates the acceptable behavior and culture in your home. You say, in this home, we wake up in the morning to pray. When there is a vigil in church, we attend the vigils. Amen. It doesn't matter whether we are whether we're pastors or we're workers. No. When the church says that it is, is a time for God, we do it. So you validate behaviors. Amen. You live in a home, your child wears tattered clothes, he wears all manner of nonsense. You wake up one morning and say, you know what, in this home, we don't wear this kind of clothes. I know you've learned it from your friends. You've learned this particular one from friends. But in this home, this is not acceptable. It's a lot of burden for women to carry, to shape, to shape the lives of their children, especially the boys. Hallelujah. You validate behaviors. You validate whether the enemy evades your space or not. I'll give you an example. One day my wife woke up in the morning and said ah, that, um, that um, she had a bad dream. And she narrated the dream. I told her to kneel down. I placed my hand on her head and I destroyed that, that invasion. Why? Because I have an understanding that I have that authority over her. I said, kneel down. And I prayed over her. Your children is ill. Lay your hands on them. Before you call any pastor, in fact, for me, you must have exhausted your own spiritual space before you escalate it. In the place of work, we have something we call um, ex escalation pro policy. You need to first exhaust one level of escalation before you move to, before you call your pastor, pray over it. Let me share something with you, um, man. The authority you have over your home, no pastor has it. The authority that you have over your home. No pastor has that authority. If there is an, an invasion in your space, you must fight that invasion away. Whether it is physical or it is spiritual. And that is why it is important for you to come to church so that you are constantly refueling. Amen. You are constantly refueling. There is me doing service, communion. Come, come and refuel. There is an um, seven days night vigil in church. Come, come and refuel because you need it. So that when the enemy evades your space, you tell him, no, you are not allowed here. Praise the Lord. So it's the man's spiritual responsibility to establish and to sustain covenant in his own it's the man's responsibility to validate what happens in his own. Number three. A man is the chief priest of his home. Hallelujah. A man is the chief priest. He may not be the, the chief priest of Israel right, Governor Ministry, his papa. Amen. But in his home, he is the chief priest. And as a chief priest, it is your responsibility to establish the kingdom of God in your home. In fact, the Bible does not allow you to lead a ministry if you've not successfully led your home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what do you do as a chief priest? Establish a prayer altar. There should be a prayer altar that you constantly fuel. Every house has, a, has an altar. Pastor came yesterday during the power encounter. He said every market has an altar. Your, the altar in your home should be bigger than the altar in the market your wife sells. So that that altar will bow to the altar in your home. 
an altar is as strong as the service you give to it. If you service your altar once in maybe a week, it will just be that strong. Hallelujah. It will just be that strong. But if you service it daily, amen. So I, I, I come from a lineage of both father and mother. They have idols. Hallelujah. And from what I know, that idol, they must put something on it every day. Something must go on it. I'm not talking about one. I'm talking about different idols. And each one needs to get something. So the altar in your home, you must service it in the place of prayer. Call your family together. Anybody that comes into your home must bow to that altar. Amen. Because it's a bigger altar than any other altar. Hallelujah. So as a chief priest, make sure you establish a prayer altar in your home. Another way to establish a, a prayer altar in your home is to have a house fellowship in that home. And be the one to lead it. I appreciate those who have leaders who lead their house fellowship, but we need to grow. We need to have a house fellowship altar in every home. I walked up to, to a man in church. I think it was late last year. And I walked up to him. I, I first spoke with his son. I said, are you ready to, can you lead the house fellowship in your home? He said, yes, why not? Pastor, I will. So I walked up to the dad. I said, son, I think we should start a house fellowship in your home. And I think your son should lead it. He said, no. So that I'm going to lead it. When he gets to his own home, he should go and lead his own house fellowship. At first, the thing felt like, uh -uh, you don't get time. This, but, but later, I felt like, you know what? This man is the chief priest of his own. And what he's teaching his son is much more than out fellowship. He's teaching his son leadership. That you do not abdicate your responsibility as a father to your son. No matter how busy you are, the house fellowship in your own, in his own, I'm going to lead it. And when I talk about this man, he's a busy man. But he said, when he gets to his own home, he should go and lead his own household. And guess what? That boy will definitely learn from his father that he's not only the chief priest in organizing morning prayers, doing night vigils. When he comes to house fellowship, as busy as he is, he still takes responsibility for it. Man, take responsibility for house fellowship in your homes. In fact, start with your family. All you need is you, your wife, and the child. And it will get to a point where you will either have a large family, people coming from all over who don't have fathers and need father, and they can say fatherhood in you, they will come to you. But you must first be successful with your own home. And if it's only you and your wife, hold the house fellowship where two or more are gathered. Two or more. The baseline is two. You don't need 10 people. You don't need 20 people. You don't need 200 people to have fellowship. You only need one person and the other person who will fellowship. The Holy Spirit will be the third person. Praise the Lord. Number four. That's the last point. Hallelujah. A man is the chief learning officer of his home. Amen. So in the secular space, we have a department. Usually it's either under human resources or it's a standalone business like in organizations like Google. The responsibility of that department is to research learnings and then teach people. Praise the Lord. They will go and research what is the new space in technology. What is the new research in medicine? And they will gather all of those information and ensure that they develop the capacity of that organization to compete in the space. You must do that in your home. You must fuel your children with enough word of God for them to go and compete in the world. Let's read Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 4, I'll read. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition 
of the Lord. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The reason, maybe the reason that child is angry is because you've not, you are not putting in he the training and admonition of God. Because after the Bible said, you know what, don't, don't let them get angry. He then replaced it with the training and admonition of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. So it is your responsibility to ensure that you train your children. Let them know God. Let them become giants of faith. While I, was, while I was in the primary school, I think I should be in primary two or primary three, we had a boy then, a seven-year-old boy, that God was working miracles through. And they were bringing him from school to school. He would come, he would preach the Bible, preach the scriptures. He was an evangelist. God would walk through him. There would be signs and wonders. His father is a pastor. He has a tutor. Somebody showing him that this is the way of the Lord. Amen. So, the Bible is saying that we must teach these children. We must teach our children. But you see, for you to effectively teach, you must sufficiently know. Because what you don't know, you cannot teach. For you to teach your children, and you don't need to be a pastor. You just need to have a knowledge of Christ. For you to effectively teach your children, you must have sufficient knowledge to do that. And how do you do that? For me, an overall way, a cheat code to sufficiently know is to follow a father. Paul says that you should follow me as I follow Christ. So who are you following? People come to church and they don't have fathers. Hallelujah. How many of you know our papa has a father? Amen. He follows Dr. Mike Mudok without forgetting his relationship with Archbishop Idaosa. So he has somebody he's following. You. Man, who are you following? There is a coaching session that was open for I don't know how many days. And they keep announcing that, and you did not sign up. Who are you following? And talk about success. When God has walked through a man, he has all of the wisdom that you can tap into. I was happy when, when um, some of my, my friends in church who were new came up and said, register me. In fact, register my wife. That's people, people who have not spent a year in church. They subscribed. You, have you subscribed? Another one is coming up next year. Please subscribe. In fact, don't wait till that time. Gather all the messages that Papa has preached on any topic. On parenting, on marriage, on finances, on life, and listening to them. Praise the Lord. So you must follow Papa, who is our Paul, as a follow scribe. For me, I don't join church anyhow. I'm very careful at the church I join. Even now, if I travel to any state, I have a church I can attend. Just one church that I can attend. When I came into El Shaddai Kavaram Church, it took me years before I decided this is the church I'm going to be attending. Why? Because I need to be careful of the person that is leading me. Amen. I was sitting, okay, then it was, um, it used to be four, we used to have four rows. I used to stay on the second row, at the middle, on the same chair. On the very, on the same, I won't miss this, on the same chair. And when it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, before you finish, amen, I'm downstairs, so you don't know me. But at the point, I felt like, you know what, this is a person I can follow. They have the truth. They don't look your face. There is no um, favoritism. In fact, the closer you are to them, the tougher they become. Because, and that's the mistake we make. 
some of us want to treat, treat our biological relationship, the relationship with our biological father, the same way we treat the relationship with our spiritual father. It's not the same way. They're different people. They're different, different things. Your spiritual father is not looking for anything from you. You are the one looking for something. So why your father is the one calling your mother and say, how are you? Have you eaten? You are the one who will need to follow up on your spiritual father. You know why? He's got many children. You're the one who wants to pick stuff from him. The way my dad will call me, Alpha, have you done that thing? It's not the way my spiritual father will call me. Because I should then come back to him and say, that thing we agreed. This is what I have done. This, that's, that's a topic for another day. But your relationship needs to be different. You can't say even my father. And please, I respect fathers. You know, that's what we're talking about. Whether he's born again or not, he has some authority over you and you must honor him. You must. There is a place of honor that you owe him. But when it comes to growth, and it's not your biological, even when your biological father is your spiritual father, he cannot train you the same way. They're two different it's two different paths. Praise the Lord. So I end with this. Hallelujah. And this is for women who are married. For singles, I've told you what to do. If at this moment, I shouldn't tell you not to marry an unbeliever. You should know. But from women, please, if you have husbands who are not, some brothers are smiling. Some of them are not born again. No. Amen. So even you men, eh, have something in your life women can submit to. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. It's not because you are a man. That's why, no, 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 no. You must carry some level of anointing. The pastor shared a, a ministry, a, a testimony with me. He said, when we first got married, he said, my wife will not, will not respect me. He didn't, have, he didn't have work. He was not working. He was just doing this agent. He said, my wife will not respect me. They will come to church, you will preach, every other person will say, daddy, daddy, daddy. The woman will not say anything. Until one day, a church member called him and said, ah, the wife is ill. So, <laughs> pastor just wore short nika with the wife. They went to do visitation. They were let's just go home and, in fact, food self, he will not even cook. So, when they got to the woman, to the woman who was ill, and pastor said, so let us pray. And pastor began to pray, and pastor lay hands on the woman. And the woman vomited and put come out of her body and she was healed. When they got home, I don't know where the woman downloaded the respect from. She could see an anointing over the man's life. Till I met them, I left them. The man was not still working. But she called, it's, it's no longer sugar, honey, or by name. It's now daddy. Because there is an anointing the man carries. Single men, let us carry anointing home. Women are also human beings. We cannot only be showing them the, the only scripture you know is a wife submit to your husband. You don't know any other one. Hallelujah. You must know beyond that one. Amen. If she needs to have an explanation from the scriptures, she should come and meet you first. Hallelujah. I hope that's not damaged. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You should be the first person. She will come and meet and say, explain this place to me. But the first time she explains, ah, go and look at Google. Uh, did you write to them the Papa's message? Uh, did, did you, you say, ah, I didn't even go to church. You don't even have a Bible. You need to carry power to demand automatic respect. Let your submission not be tic-pac -tic submission. Let her have something. She can submit to. And of course for women, if you have a husband who you know is still trying to till, trying to get the God, pray for him. There is nothing beyond prayers. We give out, um, um, what's this? What's this form we give out every Sunday? Connection card every Sunday. There is a place for prayer point. Put that prayer point there. Amen. Say, God, touch my husband. Because the moment God touches your husband, half of, half of your job is done. Pray. And when you want to correct him, eh, 
you need to correct him with all of respect. I don't know how to do that because I'm not a woman. Maybe you need to discuss with mama on it. Hallelujah. Because men, by nature, we don't want anybody to tell us what we are doing wrong because we know. So the moment you come to tell us what we're doing wrong, it will be, it will be a fight will start. So I don't know how you do that. But make sure in your correction with him, or correction of him, you are quiet, you are calm. In fact, speak in tongues before you correct him. So by the time you start, he says, yes, yes, I know, I'm sorry. And then he corrects himself. As we do all of this, the Lord will bless us in the name of Jesus. Jesus.